From the field to the film room to the war room, we've got you covered every step of the way as the road to the draft starts right now on BGN Radio. Hello and welcome to episode number three of the 2023 BGN Draft Show. Uh, Today we are going to be breaking down our top 10 offensive line prospects. If you know the Philadelphia Eagles, you know they love to build through the trenches and offensive line is probably high on the priority list this offseason. We're going to break down the top 10 guys and several honorable mentions uh, in what we think is a very deep offensive line class. I'm joined today uh, by Dives. You can give him a follow on Twitter at Mr. Crockpot. You can check out his podcast, Party on Broad. Dives, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing well, man. Just a few days away from the NFL scouting combine. We did the quarterback class rankings. Not so much fun. I promise you guys, you're going to be in love with a, a 10 plus guys uh, here to talk about. I uh, love the uh, offensive line class in 2023. All right. Awesome stuff. And I'm also joined by Mark Henry Jr. Give him a follow on Twitter at Mark Henry Jr. Underscore. You can check out his radio show, the Tough Cover Radio Show. And he is my co-host on Chalk Talk. Mark. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing great. And, you know, the the quarterbacks, that's the flash. That's the sexy names. That's the that's the big topic on ESPN. That's the topic you'll talk to your friends about at the bar. But if you're a true sicko, if you're a true nerd like we are about the draft, this is where you want to be listening uh, with offensive line. And Shane Half and Dives are the two best I know breaking down uh, offensive line play. I'm just merely, uh, I'm a guest here, trying to trying to learn the ways uh, of the offensive line breakdowns of Dives and Shane. So uh, I'm really looking forward to, to this breakdown. You, you have not lived until you've powered through a migraine grinding FCS offensive tackle tape. So, uh, so here we are. We're going to dive into it. We're going to give you our top 10. We're combining all offensive line together because – you know, to be honest, there's a lot of these guys that may transition from offensive tackle, kick on to the interior. So we wanted to just stack those guys up all against one another. Uh, we're going to run through them one through 10 this time with the quarterbacks. We went five to one. We're going to flip that go one through 10. So uh, whoever has the prospect ranked the highest is going to be the main person to talk about them. And so we're going to dive in with my number one, which is offensive tackle Peter Skaronsky out of Northwestern. He's a four-star prospect. Uh, He was actually the third-ranked center prospect in the country when he committed to Northwestern. And he never played center. He took over for Rashawn Slater as a true freshman when Slater opted out in 2020, and he started at left tackle for three years. And so he committed as a center, never played the position. And now he enters the NFL draft as a left tackle. Uh, He's 6'4", 315 pounds. He's just under 22 years old. Uh, As far as stats, there's not a lot of stats for offensive linemen, but per PFF, he had a 93 pass blocking grade in 2022, which was first among offensive tackles. He had a 1.3% pressure rate allowed, which ranked second amongst offensive tackles. So what is he good at? Uh, I think Skaronsky is a top tier pass protector. He's so good and so smooth in pass protection. Uh, he, he's got great balance. He's got a really smooth kick step I- into his stance. He's got really quick feet, probably the best in class as far as his sets go. Now, he, he's very high awareness player, as you would expect from a guy that was previously a center, uh, very aware of stunts and blitzers and how to pass those guys off. I thought he was good in the run game. He's got the athleticism to pull and to climb up to the second level and He's got no problem tagging defensive backs and linebackers. I look at him and I see a highly polished left tackle who could potentially play all five positions on the offensive line. So what are his weaknesses? Well, he is undersized and some teams may only view him as an interior prospect. And so that will drive him down their boards. You're not going to draft a guard as high as you would a tackle. And the other thing, and this won't sound like a negative, but he is... I think he's topped out in all of the nuances of the position. His technique's impeccable, which sounds really good, except there's instances on tape of him struggling against longer rushers and speed rushers. And that's not something I think you can coach up technically. It's just a limitation due to his size. So he he lacks explosiveness and length at times, and you just can't coach that up. So what you see with him is what you get, and it's really good. But I do think it could be problematic at offensive tackle. 
potentially. So yet again, just like Bryce Young at quarterback one, at my offensive line one, I've still got a guy that I've got some size concerns about. So uh, Mark, no, Dives, I think you had him number one as well. What did I miss on Skaronsky? Uh, what do you want to add on about his evaluation? No, you absolutely nailed it. I mean, this is the arguably the safest pick in the entire draft outside of like Will Anderson and Jalen Carter. Uh, he's a plug and play, plug and play day one potential all pro dude that can play uh, all across all five spots on that offensive line. Um, like you said, Shane, he's a master technician. He has amazing feet, uh, super smooth footwork, man. Um, and I just think he, he's his he's gotten better every single year. I, I disagree a little bit with that, Shane. I don't think he's kind of maxed out there. Uh, I, I think uh, the best is yet to come with Peter Skaronsky. This guy is my number eight prospect in the entire draft. Um, and I'm just blown away. Every time I watch him, uh, it's, it's just a, a ton of fun. This guy has unbelievable upside. All right. And Mark, you have a different number one, but before we get to your number one, Skronsky clocked in at number two for you. Uh, anything that you want to add in that we left out here? Yeah. I mean, the only thing I'll say is that my number one, two, and three offensive tackles are number eight, nine, and 10 overall on my big board. So there is absolutely no separation. Um, the I'll get to a little bit more of the difference when it gets to Paris Johnson to Skaronsky, but um, in terms of Skaronsky, there is some concerns about the arms. There is some concerns that he could shift into being a guard. I think he's probably going to be fine as a tackle. He replaced and outperformed Rashawn Slater in the <laughs> same system. Slater's obviously turned into one of the top tackles in the league. Another quick first step guy is similar to Skaronsky. Um, he's also, by the way, the grandson of former Packers Hall of Famer Bob Skaronsky. Fun fact. So little NFL pedigree there with, with Peter Skaronsky. Um, this is this is one one thing that I'll throw out there as part of the reason that he's number two for me. And it's a dumb reason. I'm not sure he's as nasty or as physical as some of these other top offensive linemen and top offensive tackles. I think that he's just missing a little bit of that, you know, nastiness that you want in your offensive line. I think he's like Dibes said, though, an incredibly safe prospect. And even if he is a guard, I don't necessarily think he is. But even if he is a guard, he's guard number one in this class. And he, he would still be a top 15 to maybe 20 prospect as a guard. So um, I, I'm very high on Skaronsky. It, it's just razor thin margins when it comes to these top three offensive tackles. All right. So let's talk about your number one, Mark, which is offensive tackle Paris Johnson out of Ohio State. I'll give you the floor and let you lead us off on him. Yeah, 6'6", 310 guy. Uh, his PFF grade in 2022 was an 83. He was a five-star prospect coming out of high school, number one ranked offensive tackle in his class and the number nine player overall. Uh, played right guard, then right tackle. Then he played left tackle in 2022. So he's played a little bit all over the line. He only allowed one sack this season, zero last year. Uh, really good run blocker, kind of has it all. Um, he can mirror, he can protect on a speed or a bull rush, can lead out on a screen, good on the second level, really good balance and flexibility to go with such a huge frame. You don't usually tend to think of flexibility and balance when it comes to a guy who's 6'6", 300 plus, but I think you can say that he has that. He gets off the line so fast and gets in and out of his stance so fast that the only guy I can think of when I watch him and, I, you know, Eagles fans don't get too upset with me is there's there's a little poor man's Lane Johnson to, to Paris Johnson. Uh, and it's not just he doesn't he doesn't just share a last name. Uh, he, he had a play I tweeted out against Northwestern that reminded me of Michael Orr from the blind side when he runs the guy to the bus. Like <laughs> he just ran him to the sideline, ran him like 10 yards deep into the sideline. He, as opposed to Skaronsky, has a little bit more of that edge, a little bit more of that nastiness. And he's played in some more big games against some more stiff competition in terms of edge rushers. So, And he stood up in those games. So I'm pretty high on Paris Johnson, not really much higher than I am on Skaronsky. But with the slight concerns about Skaronsky's length and with that little edge in nastiness, I gave that edge to Johnson to put him at number one. All right. Yeah, one other thing I'll mention on – Skaronsky is, uh, as far as like intelligence and intangibles, uh, he's gotten academic accolades at Ohio State. Uh, he's also established a foundation to help veterans and underprivileged kids. And so 
not that that plays into what he does on the football field, but it's always nice to know that you're getting a guy that you're not going to have to worry about off the field. And he's definitely that. Um, Absolutely. I agree with everything you said. He's, he's so physical and it's fun to watch him in the run game. I will say at times I thought he played a little too upright and he lets defenders get under his pads, which is not ideal, especially as a six, six guy. That's something that's easier to happen if you play upright. Uh, and I thought that he could use a little bit of work landing his initial punch out at defensive ends. Like sometimes missing that punch is how defenders close the gap in that length and they're able to get into his chest. So that's one thing I thought he could work on that I'm a little concerned. And I wouldn't say concerned about, but it's a technical thing that he can work on. And it is why he was my number two instead of number one. But I'm very high on Paris Johnson as well. The, the margin, like you said, is razor thin. Something interesting about that punch technique that you said, I think that that might be something that's coached at Ohio State because Dewan Jones, who, who we'll all talk about in a bit, kind of does a similar thing where it's a little bit more of a snatch than a punch with Jones, but he, he kind of gets on you early. I almost think that that might be something that's coached uh, in the Ohio State you know, offensive line room. That's That's completely a guess on my end, but I noticed that on tape that they kind of both employ similar techniques in that regard. Interesting. Yeah, I, I I don't think I noted that on Jones, but that is interesting. I'm going to go back and look for that now that you mention it. So, uh, Dives, you also have Paris Johnson, number two. Uh, what did we miss? What do you want to add on about him? Nothing. Just to add on, like, so much uh, – it's so impressive – uh with his met so impressed with his measurables man like six foot six 315 pounds uh excellent position versatility played guard in 2021 moved to tackle last season and just was outstanding great football iq leader on and off the football field uh needs to improve his play strength just a little bit uh but i mean he his feet his mobility uh everything screams just big time upside uh he's right behind Peter Skaronski on my big board at number nine. Uh, and I think this guy could be a pro bowler sooner than later. All right. So that is our top two. Uh, we'll get to number three here, which is a guy that we all have at number three. Uh, it is Broderick Jones, offensive tackle out of Georgia. Dives, I'm going to let you lead us off on this one. Uh, one of the, <laughs> we just talk about measurables. And that's going to continue here at number three with Broderick Jones. Just one of the most toolsy prospects in this entire draft, man, uh, he was a five-star recruit out of high school. Six foot four, three hundred fifteen pounds. Has a great combination of just natural leverage, proportional length, man. This dude is absolutely explosive in space. Strong at the point, a relentless finisher, man. He allowed just sixteen pressures on five hundred ninety-four pass blocking snaps at, snaps at Georgia. Uh, he can still take some time to develop uh, with his pass protection, man, and he's. Uh, struggles a little bit regaining leverage off blocks but like you look at the measurables just like you saw with paris johnson man this guy this guy's frame he, he's just so stout he's he's so built his lower half is just massive uh and i think this guy has one of the biggest upsides in the entire draft especially in that like mid first round range uh i love this guy's ceiling um i'm gonna look at my uh big board real quick i have him number 14 uh, in my on my big board, he is very raw. Uh, Broderick Jones is definitely very raw. He he um, only played 203 true pass sets in college, so that's worth noting. Uh, but Broderick Jones, man, there's a lot to like. Yeah, and just point of clarification there. Uh, so that 203 true pass sets, true pass set is essentially a pass blocking rep without play action or an RPO or a screen. So it's just straight drop back passing. Um, He's very limited in that, only 19 collegiate starts. So there is rawness in his technique. Uh, he kind of punches wildly at times, I thought. Uh, but he's got such top-tier athleticism. He clocked 19 miles per hour on the GPS this season. Uh, he is a force in the running game. And I one of the things that I thought he was so good at is just he's so good at latching on to edge rushers and just taking them out of the play. His hands are really strong. He's good at resetting his hands when he needs to. I really like Broderick Jones. A lot of upside. Just He, he might have higher upside than Skaronsky and Johnson. He's also just got more rawness, which is why he's number three for me. It's, he's it's a, he's a, he, he was a former basketball player, and you could really see it when you watch tape. 
It's pretty funny because Shane used the word latch and I have written down in my notes when he latches onto a defender he looks to run them off the field so there's uh some there's chalk talk co-hosts kind of sharing a brain a little bit there but uh some hilarious plays with him in the run game with he and Darnell Washington just running guys off the field just like you have no chance if those are the two guys that are coming at you yeah he is I mean back-to-back national champion too Roger Jones, so he's played in big games. He's played against the stiffest of competition in the SEC and then also at the next level in the postseason. So, uh, Roger Jones, I think he's relatively safe as well with his athleticism, his frame, his experience at the highest level, even if it is limited experience. I think he's relatively safe. He's actually he's still a top 10 prospect for me, even though he's my number three offensive line prospect, which tells you just how good the class is. Yeah, uh, offensive line is absolutely a strength of this class. Uh, And we'll kind of get into it as we go down our boards here where we see some of these guys fitting in. But uh, just full disclosure, I had 12 guys I wanted to talk about in the top 10 because I think they're all going to be day one and day two guys. And that's not even getting into day three prospects. It's just such a deep class. If you're Pittsburgh sitting at 17, you're praying one of those three guys drops down to you. And I've seen a lot of Broderick Jones mock to Pittsburgh, Tennessee, another team that's going to be looking at all three of these teams or all three of these guys at number 11. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to our number fours Uh, at number four. Uh, Mark and I both have the same guy. It's offensive guard Osiris Torrance out of Florida uh, Dibes has a different guy we'll talk about in a minute, but I'm going to lead us <laughs> off on Torrance. Uh, he was a three-star prospect who committed to Louisiana Lafayette, and he played three seasons there, 36 starts, before he transferred to Florida for his final season. And at Florida, in that one season, he was a first-team All-American at right guard. Uh, he's 6'5", 347 pounds. He's huge, a uh, little over 23 years old. Uh, As far as stats go, he only allowed 12 12 pressures in his first two seasons in college. And, of course, it was Louisiana Lafayette, but making the leap to the SEC, it wasn't an issue. Uh, He gave up zero sacks or hits. He posted an 89.9 PFF run blocking grade in 2022. I look at his strengths. This guy is a stone wall in pass protection. You don't drive him off the ball. He does a great job, but getting the defender getting into the defender's chest and then keeping them at bay and when he is driven off that spot he does a great job of re-anchoring he doesn't walk backwards he's really good at sinking his hips dropping that anchor and stonewalling those blitzes i thought he had a really high iq really aware of loopers and blitzers and was able to pass those guys off well Uh, he's quick off the ball in the run game and he's got for a guy this big 350 pounds he's got the ability to reach block on outside runs which Eagles fans will be familiar with like Jason Kelsey doing that a lot where maybe the run's going to the right and the guy is lined up on Kelsey's right shoulder and at the snap he jumps all the way across the guy's face and seals him out. And and it's a really important way that basically teams can steal an extra run blocker to the play side. And Osiris Torrance at 350 pounds, he's able to do that, which is just huge. As far as weaknesses, um, I think he struggles to block at the second level at times. He's not a fluid mover. He's big. He's strong. He does not move great. And so a lot of times if you get him in space, it's just easy to get around him because he's not good at tagging linebackers, defensive backs at the second level. And sometimes I felt like he was overly aggressive at the expense of his technique. It would slip a little bit. So uh, overall, I think Torrance is a really, really solid offensive guard prospect. That's where he's going to play. He's not going to go to center. He's not going to go to tackle. But as far as pure offensive guard, he's probably the best in the class. I kind of like that he played three seasons at ULL and then had to adjust to a new setting at Florida, adjust to a new level of competition. And he played even better at Florida than he did at ULL. I think that shows that he, he has shown that ability to step up a level where he's going to have to do it again from the SEC to the NFL. I think that says a lot about him as a prospect. He was a big winner at the Senior Bowl. Uh, I've seen people speculate that he'll be a big winner again at the Combine. Um, People uh, think that he 
even though he is huge and even though he's not a fluid mover, I, I think he'll impress in other ways at the combine. Um, he's an ideal power run scheme guy. So if you're one of those teams that employs that scheme, it looks like he's going to be the guard that you want to look for in this draft. But yeah, he's definitely one of my favorite prospects in this, cl- in this draft in general, not even just in this class. Uh, he's a top 15 prospect for me. All right. Uh, Dibes, you have Osiris Torrance at number six. Anything you want to add on him before we get to your number four? Not really. You guys uh, really nailed it. Um, I mean, he's still um, uh, number 27 on my big board. Uh, you guys you know, kind of just crushed it exactly why. Like, he doesn't have a lot of versatility. But, you know, for better or worse, you know, sometimes that's a good thing because he's, he's a plug-and-play uh, interior offensive lineman that would dominate – at guard for the foreseeable future. I, I can't complain about Osiris Torrance. Really big hands, massive for also better or worse because there has been times when he's almost closer to 400 pounds. Uh, so that that will definitely be needed to uh, be monitored moving forward. But Osiris Torrance is just so massive, just a huge dude. Uh, he's he you know doesn't have the best lateral mobility, struggles with quickness, uh, but in the right system, man, this guy definitely has. Big time upside. All right. So let's get into dives number four. It is John Michael Schmitz uh, <laughs> out of Minnesota. I have been hearing about John Michael Schmitz in the group chats with dives for months now. <laughs> dives, tell me why you're so infatuated with this guy. Oh, John Michael Schmitz, man. Uh, he is a six year senior prospect, tons of experience, elite football IQ, elite, elite technique. Uh, unlike Osiris Torrance, incredible mobility, uh, ability to pull, get into that second level, good upper body strength, man. I think this guy's going to do really well at the combine. He needs to develop his lower body strength, um, and he doesn't have the elite physical tools of some guys we just mentioned at the top uh, of these rankings, but uh, he makes up for it by doing all the little things, man. Uh, John Michael Schmitz, man, was terrific during the Senior Bowl. Uh, he has... Uh, he played during the Senior Bowl at all three positions on the interior. Uh, and, you know, that was kind of the big question mark. Can he, does he have the versatility uh, to kick it to guard? And my God, he just looked two steps ahead of everybody he matched up against uh, throughout practices at the Senior Bowl. Um, so, yeah, uh, great size, six foot four, 320 pounds. Uh, I think this is a plug and play dude uh, that can really uh, just, be a a core member of any team in the NFL for the next 10 years. Yeah. So he started 36 games at center for Minnesota. He was a first team all American in 2022, also second team academic all American. So he's a high IQ guy. Uh, And and I think you see that on the field. I thought he senses pressure adjusts protections. Well, he was the highest graded center uh, by PFF this season. Uh, I, I will say he, He's good at he was good at doing like reach blocks. I did think you mentioned the limited athleticism at times. I think he would struggle in like a wide zone scheme. If you can get him in an inside zone scheme, but I don't think you want him in a wide and outside zone scheme. I think that would stretch his athleticism too much. So I do think he's scheme limited, uh, but I think he's a good center prospect for a team that does not run that sort of a scheme. And like you said, I think he can kick out to guard as well uh, if a team wanted to take him for that reason. Uh, Mark, uh, you and I both had John Michael Schmitz seven dives had him at four. Uh, what what do you want to mention about him? Yeah, I mean, you guys mentioned pretty much all of it. He's extremely experienced. He's brilliant on the field in terms of pre-snap, and that's where he makes his money. He's going to you know, be drafted where he's drafted because of what he can do pre-snap and because of what he can bring to the offense as kind of the quarterback as the offense at center. Um, I'm a little concerned about the athleticism. I do think he's a day one potential starter because of his experience and because of what he can do pre-snap, but – I think that there's probably a capped upside, if I had to be honest. A comp for me that I kind of threw out there was Ben Jones, you know, a Bama center, a guy who got drafted because he was smart and experienced and stuck. He's in the league still. He's, you know, been on teams for a long time. He's been a pretty good center. He's the type of guy who's like, you know, an 81 overall in Madden perpetual. <laughs> that's kind of like what I think John Michael Schmitz will be. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that's 
off base replacement level starter is kind of where I evaluate him out at. Another thing I forgot to mention, uh, he was a high school wrestler, which is something I always like to see in the background of offensive linemen. So uh, if you're out here listening and you have aspirations of being an offensive lineman, uh, go join the wrestling team too. You learn a lot about body positioning and hand placement. You'll be so, higher on Shane's big board in a couple of years. If you do that. You, you will be higher on my big board if I know you were a high school wrestler. So, Okay, let's keep it moving along here. We're going to go to number five. Uh, number five guy on our big board, uh, or excuse me, on our offensive tackle rankings. Mark and I both have Dewan Jones. Ah. Dives has Anton Harrison. Uh, Mark, I'm going to let you lead us off with Jones, and then we'll circle back to Dives. Yeah, my number five offensive tackle is Dewan Jones out of Ohio State. And how could you not be excited about a guy who's 6'8", 360. The last two years, 82.1 PFF grade in 2022, 86.5 in 2021. He, he gave up zero sacks this year, three sacks last year, only 12 pressures and one QB hit in the last two years. He allowed the best pressure rate in college football at 1.3% last year. It's tough to bull rush him based on size, and when he gets his hands on you, it's tough to get away. And he gets his hands on you pretty fast. He tries to snatch you almost as soon as the play starts so that you can't get away from his wingspan. He had great tape against Isaiah Foskey from Notre Dame, both in season and in the senior bowl, dominated him and made him look tiny and really hurt his draft stock in both settings. Um, and Foskey's 6'5", 260. It's not like we're talking about an undersized guy. And then when you're talking about DeWan Jones, you're talking about a guy who's 6'8", 360, I think people have this image in their head of this slow-moving, lumbering, Andre the Giant-type figure. This is a guy who averaged 17 and 9 as a high school senior. He had offers from D1 teams to go and play college basketball. I'd like to see him try to take down backup five minutes for the Sixers while we're at it. I mean, they could use it. But anyway, he can scoop. You can see it on some plays. And there's, there's guys out of, you know, unfamiliar places and unfamiliar frames that have really succeeded over the last couple of years. Guys like Orlando Brown, guys like Jordan Maialata. And I think that those guys have helped his stock as a prospect a lot because being that big and doing the things that those guys have been able to do, you can see Jones do some of the similar things. He's not a total anomaly at his size and his performance in the screen game kind of shows he can be used like those guys. I like to do player comps, but, you know, this isn't an NFL player comp. My player comp for him is Gregor Clegane, the mountain from Game of Thrones, uh, if anyone knows that reference. Um, his nickname is Big Thanos, so I actually think Dibes should be obligated to bump him, uh, uh, you know, up up the board. And it's funny, I was reading scouting reports. I went deep on Dewan Jones, guys, so I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm going a little deep here, but... There was a scout that remarked that watching him blitz or watching him deal with blitzing linebackers was like watching Hulk Hogan versus Rocky Balboa in Rocky Three. <laughs> there's no competition. It's just an absolute dwarfing. This guy would have went top five in the 90s, maybe even in the early 2000s. Um, I have him as a first round prospect. He's a guy who has really risen for me as I've in, d dove into the tape. Yeah, uh, he's he is a mauler in the run game. Just massive and powerful. Has tremendous grip strength. He rarely loses a rep like once his hands are on the defender. And it happens so fast, like you said, with his long wingspan. Uh, I didn't think he's the most agile guy. And so, of course, he's massive. And so that's going to happen. Uh, but I felt like watching his tape, sometimes he gets a little top heavy. I honestly think that he would be better served to cut a little weight at the next level to get a little more athletic and nimble. Like there's the law of diminishing returns comes into effect when you're 360 pounds. Like if you drop to 345, you're not going to lose much strength, mm -hmm. but you might get a decent athletic gain. So I do think that should probably be a priority for him at the next level. But I love Dewan Jones. He was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, and I have him at number five as well. Dives, you have him down at number eight. Uh, what, what were your thoughts on Jones before we get to your number five? And to be fair, like he might be number eight on this list, but I, I think he's a first round no brainer uh, selection uh, going into the senior bowl. Uh, Dewan Jones was, you know, had uh, elite measurables. We all know that. 
Uh, but I really was curious about how his feet and uh, things would hold up, you know, against quicker edge rushers at the senior bowl and one-on-ones during practices. You did not see that at all. I mean, he, you go watch some senior bowl tape on Dewan Jones. He was incredible. He won almost every single rep. He was arguably the best, most talented, most jaw dropping uh, offensive tackle prospect in the senior bowl. Uh, Dewan Jones is number eight. I might be a little low on the him because um, I think he's a first rounder. And just like everybody else on this list, I think he has Pro Bowl upside. Uh, Dewan Jones is probably definitely way too low on my on my rankings here. All right. I always love it when Mark and I can convince Dibes, Dibes to change his rankings. I love all these guys. Air. I said it from the top. Great group. And by the way, I'm literally talking about Ant-Man. Uh, on the side here while we do this show. So I'm a huge Marvel fan. The fact that this guy is Big Thanos, bump him up, man. This Dibes' is channeling is inner Howie Roseman. If he was in charge of this draft, the Eagles would draft three offensive linemen in the first two days. So, <laughs> so Dibes, let's dive into your number five guy. It's Anton Harrison out of Oklahoma. He's number six on my board. He's down at number 10 on Mark's board. So why don't you lead us off and tell us what you like so much about Harrison? Uh, just to kind of piggyback off of that, like I, I think uh, for Eagles purposes, there's a very real scenario where like they trade back just a little bit and nab one of these guys that we're talking about today. Uh, I would not be upset if they did that kind of move. But Anton Harrison, uh, massive dude at six foot six, 309 pounds, has the smeat of a, a smeat, the feet of a smaller player, man. Uh, he has really good burst. Uh, he has really good footwork. Uh, he plays with like a smoothness. He runs with a smoothness in his game, like a basketball player, like a like a tight end would in the NFL, uh, which is really good for like a 300 plus pounder, man. Um, he's a finesse guy. Uh, he, he has uh, really good feet, like I said. Um, he has really good handwork and he's really good in pass protection. This is a developmental guy. Uh, that's the first thing you need to know about Anton Harrison. Um, he, he's got really good measurables, but it's, it's going to take a year or two, uh, of coaching and seasoning to kind of get the most upside out of this guy. Uh, he's kind of, you've seen, uh, year after year progression and improvement from Harrison, uh, at Oklahoma. And he's got a decent amount of snaps over 1800 snaps, uh, to his name. Uh, so just with a little more development with a little more kind of play strength, uh, I think uh Anton Harrison has a ton of upside yeah he he only allowed one knockdown on 425 pass blocking snaps this year and, and that was with Dylan Gabriel at Oklahoma so he was playing left tackle Dylan Gabriel's left-handed and so that wasn't the blind side uh, for what difference that makes but he, Gabriel's mobile, but he's not, you know, like a Lamar Jackson type that was going to get away from a lot of pressure. So he was solid. He's solid at left tackle. I, he's real athletic. He's got lots of range in the running game. Uh, Oklahoma likes to pull their guys, pull their tackles, pull everybody, and uh, he fits in there. I think one of his weaknesses, though, is his functional strength. Uh, he, he's not overpowered. You don't watch him and just see him getting blown backwards, but he needs to add strength. And uh, there was an improvement from 2021 to 2022. I've watched more games of Harrison than anybody else because I'm an Oklahoma fan. I've watched every game, but he improved in that aspect. And it's something he's acknowledged he's working on, but it's something he's going to have to continue to work on uh, at the next level. I, I really like Harrison as a prospect, uh, especially if you can bring him in and not throw him into the fire, like Dives mentioned. I think he's a guy that could benefit from a year in an NFL weight room uh, with some NFL coaching. And I think that he has potential. I think he's a little bit, he has a little longer on ramp to becoming good, but I think he could be a really good player. And so he is number six for me, Mark. He's all the way down at number 10 for you. You're not a big Anton Harrison guy. Uh, <laughs> why don't you tell us why? And he barely made it there at 10. I, I really <laughs> wanted to get one or two other guys in there, but um, he is very technically sound and he's very good in pass protection. Um, in terms of straight up, and he's good at dealing with edge speed. Uh, so I, I think a lot of that is just there's enough there, and he's 6'5", to say that you know he, he's a pretty good project to, to bet on in terms of offensive tackle. But I'm hearing him as a first-round guy, and I, and I think that's questionable because if you're going to draft him in the first, you're going to want him to play 
pretty fast, and I don't think he's ready to do that. There's just too many things I saw that I didn't like. Um, he, he probably should have and could have stayed another year at Oklahoma to build up his body and get it to the NFL ready. But with the dumpster fire that Oklahoma has become, sorry, Shane, I understand hey, why hey. you get out of there. I had to fit that in. Um, but he's not the kind of explosive athlete that you know I, I think is going to really improve his stock at the combine. Uh, and I don't think he's the type of explosive athlete that's going to really knock your socks off. I, I don't think he plays with a mean streak, really. I, I haven't seen any of that. And, and then according to PFF, I, I, I straight up just stole this, but Harrison's ability to hold up to power rushes is borderline unplayable by NFL standards. And I've got to say, I think I agree with that. Like, I don't, I don't think he seems strong to me. He doesn't seem like he blows people away. He doesn't seem like he pushes anyone back. And I, I do think that if, if you're already seeing that in the Big 12, I, I think that could be concerning at, at the next level. Um, but like I said, very technically sound. So he still made my list and be, mainly because of that offensive tackle, you know, positional value. It's probably what the third or fourth most important position in the sport. So uh, when you have the base traits in terms of pass protection, I can kind of ignore a lot of concerns, at least in terms of putting you in the top 50 or 60 prospects. We're through the top five. Uh, we're going to get to number six here. Uh, Number six for Mark is the only guy whose number six is not yet revealed. It's Cody Mock. He's number seven for Dives. He's number eight for me. Uh, so, Mark, we'll let you lead us off. Uh, tell us about Cody Mock. Yeah, Cody Mock is a guy who I think is going to end up going in the first round, in part because of his positional versatility. Um, 6'6", 300, uh, 90.8 PFF grade in 2022, 88.9 in 2021, uh, allowed only one sack in each of the last two years. Uh, deceivingly, really good athlete. I, I think if you look at him, you see the mullet, you see North Dakota State on the helmet, you're not going to think that this is some you know next-level athlete, but you can make an argument he could legitimately play any of the five offensive line positions. He entered North Dakota State as a, as a tight end, before beefing up about 80 pounds to play left tackle. Uh, he plays with a nasty mean streak you'd expect when you see his toothless smile. Uh, he <laughs> plays like a hockey goon a little bit out there in terms of on the offensive line. Shorter arms than, than you'd like out of an offensive tackle. Uh, I've seen PFF and others say that he needs work in pass protection with his hands. I think they're kind of projecting because of the D2, uh, because he played in D2. I think there's a chance that that concern's totally unfounded because I didn't think that his hands really looked like they were misplaced or anything like that. I think that they're kind of projecting and saying that could be an issue at the next level, but I don't know what that's based in really. Great in space for screens, uh, excellent pre-snap player, kind of the leader of that offensive line, um, big, big foot truther. So I think that that's, you know, uh, that's where my, my breakdown probably ends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, if, you need to, if you don't know who we're talking about, if you haven't seen the picture, you need to go Google Cody Mock smile. <laughs> and so he lost his two front teeth on the top playing hockey. And so he oh, just got I didn't this... know it was hockey. That's funny. I thought yeah, it was basketball. Got... All right. Well, uh, I, th I think he's got a hockey background, and that's where it happened. I have to double check that now. He looks but, like uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> go look at that picture and tell me he doesn't look like Dustin from Stranger Things because that's what I think of. But, um, yeah, he, so like Mark said, he added, packed on 80 pounds, but he retained that size and athleticism. Um, he does have the short arms. Maybe it forces him to switch inside to guard, but you know, luckily he does have experience. He did take 16 snaps at offensive guard at North Dakota State, so he's got a little bit of a background. Um, he's just an excellent mover. Uh, he wins with technique and positioning, I think, more so than power. So I think he's more of a zone scheme fit guy than like a gap power scheme fit guy. Um, he's got an average anchor in pass protection, which is one thing I think he's got to work on. He struggles with power rushers. Uh, he's got some footwork issues. He, he heel clicks a lot when he's getting into his slides and things and it gets him off balance. And so that's one thing he's going to need to work on. Uh, there's some technical refinement and he is 24 years old or he might not be yet. He'll be 24 on draft night if he's not yet. So he's on the older end. He's making the leap from FCS, but uh, that athleticism is something you bet on. And I, I don't know if he goes round one, maybe he sneaks into the back end of round one, but if not, he's going to be an early day two guy. Uh, and I think that, you know, he offers a lot of versatility, like Mark said. 
All right. Uh, Dives, did you have anything you wanted to mention on Mock before we move on to the next round of guys? No, I just have this image of Cody Mock and Dustin from Stranger Things singing Never Ending Story in the back of my head. And that, that, I, I would pay to see that. But yeah, like you guys said, he was a former quarterback, tight end, came into North Dakota State weighing 220 pounds. He's entering the NFL draft over 300 pounds. Uh, it's incredible. Just You can see that athleticism with his just ridiculously quick feet. Yes, he is a big-time project, a developmental guy. Uh, but uh, at the Senior Bowl, he played center and dominated, absolutely dominated every single practice, uh, like uh, some other, other guys like John Michael Schmitz at the Senior Bowl. Just looked three steps ahead of every single uh, defensive lineman they went up against. Uh, Cody Mock is a first rounder in this draft. My comfort, they, uh, my comfort mock was going to be Dylan Radunes, but I think I'm just going to make it Bigfoot. I think he's, <laughs> I think he might just be Bigfoot. I think his whole Bigfoot truther thing might be an act. I'm just saying right now, Bryce Young's agent needs to call up Cody Mock and be like, hey, how did we pack 80 pounds on and stay athletic? Because <laughs> I've got a client that needs to put on a little bit of weight. I'm not <laughs> Throwback to our QB ranking show. If you haven't watched it, go listen to that. We had a lot of conversations uh, about Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, all of those guys, but we won't relitigate that here. Let's move on. Uh, the number eight guy on Mark's board, the only guy who doesn't have number eight revealed yet, is Darnell Wright. He did not make the top 10 for dives or I. Uh, so, Mark, why don't you talk to us about Darnell Wright? Yeah, he's 6'6", 335, so obviously you don't have any size or frame concerns. Um, 2022 PFF grade was 71.4. He was a four-year starter, but that really just means he had three years of terrible tape and a lot of pressure allowed on his quarterbacks. Not not good tape for three straight years. And then he kind of put it all together in 2022. He allowed zero sacks and a 1.7% pressure rate, third in the country. He was a big prospect coming out of high school. People kind of were calling him a bit of a bust. Tennessee has had a lot of that where they get these big prospects coming out of high school and they don't really even get to the NFL draft. Well, at least he put it together in his last year there. Some people are saying he might be more of a guard. To me, that doesn't make any sense with his size and frame. That's a tackle, I think, especially with his experience as well. And I, I have to be honest. I'm not all that high on right. I think the tape's concerning. I think he's slow moving. I think his feet aren't that great. I think he needs to improve his balance. But there's four things that are keeping me from him dropping like a rock in my rankings. One, he's a former top 10 prospect coming out of high school, like I mentioned. He's 6'6", with absolutely zero size concerns. His concerning three years and his encouraging last year all occurred in the rigorous SEC at the highest level outside of the NFL. At least you don't have to worry about quite as much of an adjustment. And then most importantly, he shut Will Anderson down. There it he is. He forgot he was on the field. Damn you could argue he did a better job on Will Anderson than any tackle in Anderson's entire career did at, while he was at Bama. That alone probably got him a spot in my top 10, to be honest. I have a lot of concerns, but if you're able to handle Will Anderson and the, and the height, and the speed and everything he throws at you for four quarters and put up, what, 50 points or whatever Tennessee put up on that defense, you know what? You've earned a spot in my top 10, Darnell, right? Yeah, he had a weird career arc where he started at right tackle and then he's moved to left tackle and then back to right tackle. So he's got experience on both sides. Uh, on the guard thing, like I, I did have in my notes that I wondered if he could move to guard because – my, one of my bigger issues was him with him was his footwork and his fluidity there in space on the edge. But at guard, the footwork wouldn't be an issue, and he's so powerful, especially in the run game. So I wondered if he would be a good fit at guard, but it's not guard size. It is tackle size. So I, I do think maybe there's some versatility there if a team wanted to tap into it, even though he didn't ever do that at the college level. It's at least an interesting thought process. Okay. Let's roll on to our number nines here. We all have different guys at number nine. So, Dives, I'm going to let you lead us off first with Andrew Voorhees. Why don't you tell us about him? Oh, my gosh. I mean, he's been in college forever, six years. <laughs> uh, nearly 3,500 career snaps. Uh, Andrew Voorhees, I, I really like this guy. He's really big. I think six foot six. Uh, one of the most experienced players in this class, man. Uh, he has uh, five years as a full-time starter or uh, a starter for most of the season. He's only conceded allowed 
11 career sacks uh, during his uh, college career, man. Really good grip strength, really good power in his anchor, man. Um, he has, uh, what, he's 320 pounds, but he he's a really good mover. Uh, Weakness-wise, like, he struggles to kind of consistently maintain leverage uh, due to his immense size. But, man, like, uh, this guy is one of the best pass and run blockers uh, in this draft. And I, I think he's a scheme-diverse player as well. Uh, he, you could probably throw him into like any different, any kind of concept and he'd be fine. And he has just a really strong base. Uh, like a lot of these guys, I think this is a plug and play guy from day one. And we were talking before this show, before we went live, I would not be shocked at all to see Voorhees come in and be nearly a pro bowl level talent on the interior for an NFL team sooner than later. All right, uh, Mark, your number nine is Blake Freeland. Uh, why don't you talk to us about him? I think I have a type, guys, so let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, you do. I, I like big, tall offensive tackles, and Blake Freeland is the tallest. He's 6'8", 3'10", 91 on PFF uh, in terms of his grade in 2022, 81.7 in 2021, 81.6 in 2020. He allowed zero sacks in 2020 and in 2022 only allowed one sack in 2021 allowed only seven combined hurries over the last two years he was the nation's second highest graded tackle behind notre dame's joe alt uh shout out to notre dame uh and, and then his 90.7 pass blocking grade and 87.9 run blocking grade were third in all of college football he's one of the class's most experienced tackles he's got 2700 career snaps uh, second most among tackles in the draft, high school quarterback and tight end. He also was a high school basketball star who threw down thunderous dunks. There's some pretty good clips on Twitter that you can go and find. A uh, definite backup center option, just like Paris Johnson for the Sixers. Switched from right <laughs> tackle to left tackle halfway through his career. Tremendous footwork for a big man. Great hand usage. At his best on the move, a swing tackle for sure. Now, the size concerns are, is, are what's dragging him down. If he was probably 30 pounds bigger, maybe 40 pounds bigger, he'd be a top five uh, player on this board for me, I think. Uh, I think that's literally basically all the concerns come down to is him being a little bit lanky him being a little bit long him being a little bit upright. Uh, and, and, you know, hopefully he goes to an NFL team that has him sit for a year and has him add muscle and mass to his frame. Yeah, so the common thread that holds all of Mark's guys together is that none of them could be on an offensive line for Bryce Young because he couldn't see over any of them. <laughs> <laughs> I have a type. It's why I would not uh, – Kyler Murray would never be my quarterback because he just wouldn't – you'd have to drop back 40 yards. Yeah, that's true. All right, so my number nine is uh, offensive tackle Matthew Bergeron from Syracuse. No, I didn't pick it just because I think Bergeron is an awesome last name and fun to say. Uh, he started his career at right go or excuse me, right tackle in 2019. Uh, and he became the first true freshman to start for Syracuse in almost 20 years. Uh, later, he moved to left tackle in 2020, uh, where he kind of finished out his career there. He is 6'5", 322 pounds, just a little over 23 years old. Uh, he he's very athletic and smooth. Uh, like that's what I think characterizes his game more than anything is his smoothness, his fluidity. Uh, he's got really good range in the running game. He's got really good technique in the running game. Every, he's just technically sound. Everything about the run game is great, which is good because everything about the pass game is not so great, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, I, I, that's not true. I think he's got good awareness in pass protection. Like He recognizes what's happening, and he'll pass off stunts well. But he's got inconsistent hand strikes, both in his placement and his timing. Uh, that causes struggles in pass protection at times. He has a hard time keeping uh, edge rushers on the edge. And I think he lacks functional strength. Now, at the college level, he made up for it with his technique. That's not going to work at the NFL level. He's going to have to add strength. And I always go back and forth with, would you rather have a technically sound but not a strong guy and trust that you can bulk him up? Or would you rather have the physical guy and think you can refine his technique? I think it could go either way. But he's going to have to pack on some strength. And I do wonder if he could, he might could transition to offensive guard at the NFL level as well. He's one of those guys that I think you could kick inside. So I think he's got some versatility. Uh, I really liked what I watched him 
in the run game. I think it could mitigate some of his pass protection issues if you kicked him inside where he wasn't playing in space as much. So uh, that was my thought when I watched uh, Matthew Bergeron. And so we'll kick it to our number 10 here. Uh, Dibes and I have the same number 10. We've already talked about Marks, uh, but it is Joe Tipman from Wisconsin. Dibes, I'll let you lead us off on Tipman. Oh, I love Joe Tipman, man. Um, this was uh, the guy that took Blake Freeland off my list. Um, I, I think Joe Tipman is one of the biggest sleepers in this draft. Uh, uh, 625 pass blocking snaps the last two years at Wisconsin. He's only allowed one snack at one sack and nine pressures uh he's an athletic freak at six foot six 317 pounds super strong offensive lineman man i think this guy's going to be a household name at the combine this week uh really quick out of his stance and pass protection uh he sets too high at times weaknesses wise um but he's he's an incredibly like rare tall center uh that can really play well with leverage and get out and block. I, Joe Tipman, man, is so underrated. Um, I think he, he's the only guy on this list that I don't have a first round grade on, uh, but I would not be shocked at all to see him drafted by some team in that back end of round one. I, I think Joe Tipman is being slept on right now. Yeah, so he was a three-star recruit. Uh, he redshirted at Wisconsin, and then he barely played his second year before he took over in 2021 as their center. And He's got a rare build for a center at 6'6". That's not that's tackle height, but very strong and athletic in run blocking. Uh, he can do all the blocks. He can uh, double team defensive tackles with a guard. He can execute reach blocks. He can uh, snap the ball and pull uh, as a lead blocker on like counter plays, those sorts of things. He does a really good job of that. Like It's Jason Kelsey-like how he's able to snap the ball and immediately just get out to the edge. I thought he was really reliable in pass protection. He's always looking for incoming blitzers, delay blitzers, whatever. Uh, he seamlessly passes guys off to his guards and stays stays home. But the height, it might be an issue. I, I don't know. He's taller than the average center, and it causes leverage issues for him at times. Guys are able to get under his pads. And, I mean, low man wins. Low man always wins. And so... To combat that, he has to get hands on the defender first and dictate the rep. And I felt like he struggled with the balance of lunging at defenders to get the hands on first or being late with the punch and allowing the opponent to get under his pads and dictate that rep. And so that's one of the things you have to watch out for there on the interior. But he's so fluid. Uh, he's a definitely a fun guy to watch. I, I know you're you know you're a sicko if you talk about centers being fun to watch, but if anybody understands that, that's Eagles fans that have watched Jason Kelsey for years. And Tipman is a very fun guy uh, to watch on the offensive line. So that's going to round out our top ten here. We've got a couple honorable mentions, but I'll just run through the one to ten here. I went one to ten. Uh, Peter Skaronski, Paris Johnson, Broderick Jones, Osiris Torrance. Dewan Jones, Anton Harrison, John Michael Schmitz, Cody Mock, Matthew Bergeron, and Joe Tipman. <clears throat> Mark has at number one, Paris Johnson, uh, Peter Skaronsky, Broderick Jones, Osiris Torrance, Dewan Jones, Cody Mock, John Michael Schmitz, Darnell Wright, Blake Freeland, and Anton Harrison. And dives one to 10 is Peter Skaronsky, Paris Johnson, Broderick Jones, John Michael Schmitz, Anton Harrison, Osiris Torrance, Cody Mock, Dewan Jones, Andrew Voorhees, and Joe Tipman. Now, sometimes it's hard to get, you know, all the guys we want to talk about in here. There's day three prospects. There's honorable mention guys. Uh, Dives, I know you've got a day three prospect or two you want to shout out. Uh, I want to shout out a guy that just missed my top 10 first, and I'll kick it to you. And it was interior offensive lineman Steve Avila out of TCU. Uh, he was a redshirt fresh or redshirt senior with 30 plus games of experience. He's a back-to-back All-American. He was a team captain in 2022. Um, he has starts at center. He has starts at right tackle. He played left guard in 2022. He's played all over the offensive line. So uh, he's 6'4", 334 pounds. Uh, he's 23 and a half years old. He only allowed two hits and nine hurries on 540 pass blocking snaps this year. So uh, he's really aggressive as a run blocker, and I thought he uses his plus size to create displacement and movement in the run game. And he anchors really well against power rushers. 
However, as it usually does, power comes at the expense of speed. And I thought he's got limited lateral mobility. And so engaging speed rushers is more problematic. Dealing with loopers on stunts was a little more problematic. He's not the most fleet footed guy and thought he was stiff in the lower body a bit. So I don't think he's a good fit for his own running scheme. Uh, you're going to want him more in a power scheme, firing off the ball instead of trying to string plays out. And so, you know, probably not a good fit for a team like the Eagles, who's more zone rushing. But Steve Avila, I do think he's got the potential to be a good, powerful run blocker on the interior for some team. Uh, so that was my guy that barely missed out. Dibes, I know you had a couple day three prospects you were interested in, specifically for the Eagles. Uh, who do you have there? Yeah, when you have a guy like Jeff Stoutland that just thrives at uh, putting together uh, and developing great young offensive linemen. Let's talk about it. McClendon Curtis, interior offensive lineman out of Chattanooga. Uh, this guy has really good length, 35 inch arms, great frame at six foot five, 331 pounds, knows how to use it. He's a developmental guy, uh, but just really great physical tools at the position. Uh, needs to develop his footwork, uh, fluidity, quickness as a pass setter. Um, but you know, within a year or two, this guy has really serious upside. That is McClendon Curtis. Another guy to kind of talk about is Mark Evans out of Arkansas Pine Bluff. Uh, this guy has a, a really good track record here. Um, over a thousand pass blocking snaps since 2019, only allowed four sacks and 34 pressures at left tackle, six foot five, uh, just under 300 pounds, moves really fluid for his size. Uh, that is Mark Evans. I, I think Jeff Stoutland would do well with him. Braden Daniels, offensive lineman out of Utah, is another really strong prospect. Uh, he played uh, two years at left guard before before switching to right tackle midway through last season and, and really shined. Uh, he's only 300 pounds, but he's really explosive. Uh, I think he played tackle. I think he played guard. Has really high football IQ. Again, great athlete. Uh, and has gotten better and better and better uh, during his time at, with the Utes. So uh, I, I think all three of those guys uh, would be excellent selections for the Eagles on day three. All right. Uh, Mark, did you have any honorable mention guys that you wanted to shout out? Or were or did you cover or did we hit everybody you were talking about? Yeah, um, we kind of touched everyone I was talking about. Uh, the, I would throw Olusegun Oluwatimi out there uh, from Michigan. And <laughs> I'll throw him out there because Chris Trapasso, CBS Sports mock draft guy, has him in the, in his top 25. Um, and he is an experienced center coming from a powerhouse offensive line school in Michigan at a high level in the Big Ten. Just wanted to throw it out there as one of the center prospects because apparently he is getting some buzz uh, up there in some circles. All right. Well, there you have it, folks. That is going to wrap up our offensive line top 10 this time. Uh, we won't have two shows out to you guys every week, but we are going to have to do some double episode weeks to get you uh, everybody you need to know before the uh, before the NFL draft. So uh, we will be back next week after the NFL combine. I think we're going to dive into running back rankings next week, but don't hold me oh to that. God. We might change our mind between now and then. Uh, but we'll have the combine data. We'll have a few more data points to talk about. Pro days will start trickling in. Uh, but you guys keep it tuned right here to the BGN Draft Show. We'll get you everything you need to know to make you the smartest guy in the room at your draft party if you do that sort of thing. If you don't, you should. And you should throw our draft show up when you do it. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in this week. Make sure you like, uh, subscribe, subscribe on youtube on whatever podcasting app you're listening on five star ratings and reviews are greatly appreciated uh, they help us get the content out there to more diseased eagle fans like yourself so uh, for me dives from mark from bgn radio we will catch you guys next week for our top five running back rankings <laughs>